Okay, this is going to be an overview of the book of Obadiah. One of the minor prophets. And in Obadiah, you're going to see judgment coming on Edom for what he did to Israel. You probably remember in Numbers 20, 14 through 21, that Edom would not even let Israel pass through their border, but brought out sword against them. They weren't good to their, their brother. But what we can learn from this short book is not to rejoice in the sufferings of others, like Edom rejoiced in the suffering of Israel. When you see other people suffering, you need to pray for them and not say, well, that's what they get, or they had it coming, or I knew that was going to happen. And a lot of times people see something bad happen to somebody, and it's almost like they enjoy it. But Romans twelve fifteen says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Remember that if God pulls the rug out from under you, that you could easily go through the same thing or something even worse than somebody is going through. But what you have in Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament. It only has 21 verses in it. And if you, it's just, it's just one chapter. If you memorized a verse a day of Obadiah, you would have it memorized in less than a month. Obadiah means a servant of the Lord. And it's the only book written against a nation. And that nation is Edom. Genesis 36, 1 says, Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. So the book is directly spoken to Edom and Zion, which is Esau and Jacob. Edom being Esau, Zion being Jacob. Now our old man, the flesh... This old body that you're living in, that's represented by Esau or Edom. So he's proud. Your flesh is proud. And the new man, what you got when you got saved, the new man, it's set apart. The Edomite sold, God, sold God's people into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And you're going to see that in this chapter here of Obadiah. And... The way that you can apply that spiritually today is your flesh is a sellout. If Edom represents the flesh and they sold out God's people, your flesh is a sellout. It will sell itself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. It doesn't care about your holy walk with God. It will put you in bondage to the devil. It doesn't care about the new man. Your flesh doesn't care about anything but the flesh. It doesn't care about your relationship with God. Your flesh doesn't care if you wreck your life and ruin your fellowship with God as long as it gets what it wants. So let's get into the book. Historically, Obadiah had a vision concerning Edom. Edom, that's what happened historically. Obadiah 1, 3, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? So this is a vision. You see in this chapter that Obadiah gets concerning Edom. Now, prophetically or doctrinally, you're going to see some things about the future kingdom of the Lord. In Obadiah 1, 19 through 21, And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain the Philistines. And they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead, and the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath, and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Sepharad, shall possess the cities of the south, and Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So you see, that's the Lord's future kingdom. So this isn't just history, it's prophecy. Now some practical things. Let's go through the book of Obadiah and pick out some practical things. In verses 1 through 9, you have the humiliation of Edom. If you are lifted up in pride and think God can't bring the pain on you, then you're going to be humiliated. I watch prideful people and they, do, they give others a hard time when they get embarrassed or humiliated. And then something happens to that prideful person and it hurts them. Even worse than the humble person was when he was embarrassed and humiliated. Because all this time they laughed at other people. It made it seem like they couldn't be brought down. And then God gives them a swift, swift kick to the face. And they're completely humiliated. And you can see it all over their face. They lift themselves up to be some big shot. And they don't even lift up their own expectations of themselves. 
they don't live up to their own expectations of themselves. So why are they putting all these expectations on everybody else? Making everybody feel bad when they fall or when they stumble or when they don't do good at work or, or wherever it may be. If you quit setting yourself up as some big shot and realize you're nothing and people see you as humble and lowly, when you fall, you don't have as far to, down to go because you're already low. Don't set yourself up as some big shot when you're not. Now, Obadiah, verse 3, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? You can be deceived by your pride. And this is why one of the qualifications for holding an office is to not be a novice. First Timothy 3, 6, Not a novice lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil if you're prideful then the devil can get a hold of your life and wreck it proverbs 16:18 pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall leviathan which is the devil is king over prideful men job 41:34 says he beholdeth all high things he is a king over all the children of pride pride is something that the devil has a problem with. Proverbs 11, 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Ezekiel 16, 49. Pride is one of the sins of Sodom. I see people who are full of pride, and I always think to myself, if they don't watch it, the Lord is going to let the devil chin check them. Some people don't even think God can bring them down. That's what Edom said. Who shall bring me down to the ground? I remember they said about the Titanic that God couldn't even sink the ship. You see some of these UFC fighters and boxers, they think that God couldn't beat them in a fight. They don't think they can be defeated. But verse 4 says, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Remember, the devil said he would exalt his throne above the stars of God. So who are you trying to be like? If you're trying to exalt yourself, then you're being like Lucifer. It says in verse 5, If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? You see, Jesus Christ is coming as a thief in the night, and it'll be much worse than a thief coming in the middle of the night. Because they would at least leave something. Verse 6 and 7. How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat, it, eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. So the men that have, the men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee backstabbers they turned on them or they pretended to be at peace with them the only friend you really have is god and he won't turn his back on you if you're saved and 10 through 14 you have the crime of edom and 1 through 9 you had the humiliation now you have the crime verse 10 for thy violence against thy brother jacob shame shall cover thee and thou shalt be cut off forever So, how can you apply this to yourself? They did violence against their brother. And 1 John 4, 20, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? They did violence against their brother Jacob. It says in verse 11, In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, and the day that the strangers carried away captive, his forces and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. So Edom was glad when Nebuchadnezzar came in and took them captive. He was glad when they entered in their gates. But verse 12 says, But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day of he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. So see, Edom rejoiced in the pain of others. And some people just like to see other people suffer. They would never suffer for other people. 
A lot of people love to hear the latest drama because they love to hear someone is going through a divorce or if their kid has gotten on drugs, especially if they don't like the person. I know some Christians who hate their brother so much that if that brother's kid, uh, their toddler or something was to fall on its face on the concrete and bust its nose, they would be glad about it. They would say that is happening to them because they're so horrible. Uh, I know Christians that think a woman lost her baby because karma's coming back around them to them for what they did to them in the past. They think that they're so good and everybody else is so bad and that everybody else just deserves bad things to happen and they just deserve all these good things to happen. But verse 13 says, Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Some Christians are so led by the devil that they will not only rejoice when a brother is going through hard times, but will kick him while he is down and then take his stuff too. For example, somebody might get divorced and the other Christians make them a lower ranked Christian for it. They won't let them do anything in the church. They won't let them even teach a Sunday school class. But they still, they'll still take their money. They kick them while they're down, won't let them do nothing, but they still take their tithes and their offering so that they can buy all this stuff that they claim God wants them to have and call it God's money. Now verse 14, Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. And verses 15 through 21, you have the doom of Edom. And you'll also see in the verses how it can be prophetical as well because of the phrase, the day of the Lord, in verse 15. Verse 15, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For, ye, for as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle them in, in them, and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. The house of Jacob and Joseph will be like a fire on the house of Esau, which is Edom, and it will turn to stubble. Nahum 1.10 says this, for, the, for while they be folding together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. Malachi 4.1, for behold, the day cometh. Notice, the day cometh, that's the day of the Lord, that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the and the day that cometh shall burn them up, said the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. So that's obviously some, some stuff about the second coming there that we have here in Obadiah, where you see house of Esau for stubble. It's going to, the fire devours them. But to break the book down even more simple, the first 16 verses could be called Esau have I hated because Edom is Esau. And 1721 could be Jacob have I loved, based off of Malachi 1, 2, and 3, which says, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. So you see, the first 16 verses talk a lot about Edom's doom, which is Esau, and the last few verses talk about Israel's coming restoration in the kingdom. So Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. To really simplify the book, the first part, the first about 16 verses could be Esau have I hated. 17 through 21 could be Jacob have I loved. That's an easy way to really break down the book and remember it. But you can see that Obadiah, very short book, 21 verses. Uh, it's written against a nation, which is Edom. And they're very proud, and they've exalted themselves. And God's showing, is giving Obadiah a vision about how they're going to see their destruction. He's going to make them humble one way or another. But that is the short, minor prophet, Obadiah.